Welcome to Why I Planes Crash. Last week I did a full review of the Fly Dubai crash in Rostov on Don four years ago uh, when they crashed on the runway after the second go around attempt. And today uh, I have a guest, Peter Lundgren. He is uh, with us today. I'm going to talk about this crash. Thank you. Welcome, Peter. Thank you as much. You, your aviation career took place in uh, Stockholm in the late 80s. Yeah, that's you true. You went to the United States, uh, converted, uh, and then you came back to Sweden, converted to a Swedish license. Mm -hmm. And then you flew with uh, various operators, and uh, one of them was uh, Fly Nordic, with Fly MD-80. That's true. For about five years. Yeah, about five years. And then you moved on to Norwegian. Yeah. And you flew the 737. Yeah. Both classic and 800. Yeah, mostly the 800, but I started with the classic. Very good. And you have accumulated 15,000 hours. Yeah. And there are 10,000 as commander. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, a short summary of this crash. They have departed Dubai uh, six hours earlier. And they had about 11,000 hours together. And there are about 5,000 on the Boeing 737. And the time the crash is in the middle of the night. And uh, they took off about 10 o'clock in the evening. So, Peter, have you done a night flight like this? Yes, a lot of night flights with late check-ins starting okay, so at 10 or 11 p.m. So, so it's not unusual. It's, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so how is... How is that, that reporting about 9, 9.30 in the evening instead of 9 in the morning? Yeah, of course it's worse because you have to try to sleep before, before you check in. So, so for me it's not a big problem. I can sleep almost any time during the day. Okay. So, so, but for, for many pilots I guess it's a big problem, okay. of course. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they took off with about 18 tons of fuel. And the company policy is the captain's only landing and takeoff for Rostov and Don uh, for several reasons. And they had about four hours flight time to the first go around. And um, in the first go around, they have a predictive wind shear. And what, what is that, Peter? What's a predictive wind shear? Yeah, it's the, the system that predicts the wind shear ahead of the aircraft. So, so, so the meaning that, that it's a possible uh, wind shear ahead. So that you can get tailwind. Yeah, it's a change in dramatic change in, in wind direction and speed, which uh, which uh, deteriorates the performance of the aircraft. Of right, course. and then you just abandon the approach and climb up. Yeah, you should do a windscape, uh, wind shear escape maneuver. Right. Um, after the first go round, they have about nine tons of fuel remaining. Lots of fuel. Yeah, that's a lot of fuel. And between the go rounds, so after the go round, they go up, stay in the air, stay in the holdings. Between the go-rounds, there are two operators landing in this weather, and the third operator makes three approach attempts, three go-rounds, and then divert to the alternate. What would you think as a crew member then when you hear this? Two landings and one go-round. Yeah, that should trigger the, the uh, thought of diverting to another airport. Yeah, but the Definitely. alternate in this case is 45 minutes away. Yeah, that's a little bit longer than, than normal, but, but, but yeah, if you have to divert, you divert. So, so, but of course, uh, pilots are go miners, so we want to fly the passengers to the place they're suppo yeah, supposed to fly to, of course. The crew is then thoroughly uh, preparing for uh, the next approach. They, they take a look at the alternate they very, very good planning, good preparation. The captain also calls on the sat phone to the operator, talk with the operator, informing them about the situation. And I would say they're very, very well uh, on the market, so to speak. They follow the SOP, they, they do everything by the book. They do everything very correct. So what about this weather? It's, it's like, it's really harsh weather. It's uh, thunderstorms, it's uh, rain showers, it's uh, various winds, it's gusty winds. Uh, have you encountered that weather? Yeah, of course, many times. So, so what's it like to fly in this weather? Yeah, it takes uh, a lot of more workload, of course, and, but uh, at the same time you step up a bit. Oh, okay, of course. So yeah, yeah. You, you start to think a little bit different uh, than, than 
when it's uh, sunny weather and, and uh, calm winds because you, you prepare for, uh, for things to happen and uh, of course you do that all the time but, but it triggers you a bit more and you definitely think of, of diversion and start look how much uh, reserve fuel we have and all that things. Right. Yeah. So you live a bit so more yeah, prepared. So mentally speak. more prepared for a diversion or go around for that matter, which okay. you always should be, be prepared for, of course. But but with this weather situation and it's a little bit more you're a little bit more triggered. So they're coming in on the on the first approach. And uh, at about 1800 feet, the captain disconnects the autopilot and auto throttle. And uh, what is the um, what is your opinion? What's the recommendations about that? Well, in 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 IMC, uh, which means you're flying without visual visual uh, contact with the runway, uh, most pilots fly with the autopilot and auto thrust engaged until you uh, get visual contact with the runway. But also when it's gusty conditions, uh, you want to sort of feel the aircraft uh, in your hands yeah. before you land the aircraft, uh, especially in, in gusty conditions. So, so that could, of course, trigger you to disengage the autopilot a little bit earlier than, than normal, maybe. But in this case, a little bit uh, too early. A little bit too early, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's no really point to do it. To do it that early, if 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 it wasn't for for the the, the gusty conditions, uh, so he sort yeah, of decided to to control the aircraft himself. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Yeah, it is because we, we don't really know. And the no, investigators really also say that they don't really know why he disconnected the autopilot and not short. Anyway, he did, and this aircraft it is also equipped with a hood, H U D, head up display. Yes. What what is that? Yeah, it's a display which displays all the flight instruments on the windshield, so you don't have to look down. Oh, so I can at just your, look out yeah, through the window yeah, and I see all the information I have it in there. Exactly. I, I've seen that on cars, modern cars. Y yeah, they have that. Not my car. All <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Uh, okay. So, uh, in the first approach, they then continue down, and at 200 feet, about 200 feet, they got the field in sight, uh, which must be a relief. Like, oh. Finally, the field in sight, and shortly thereafter, they have this uh, warning: go around the windshield head, and uh, they perform the windshield escape maneuver exactly according to the protocol, which is absolutely perfect. And just to sh describe, what, what is in the windshield escape maneuver, Peter? Yeah, that's uh, meaning that you you fly the aircraft a little bit different from from a normal go around. Instead of changing the configuration, you keep the configuration. You have gear down, flaps down. Yeah, and of course you you immediately set full full thrust yeah. to the mechanical stop. Actually, oh, to the mechanical stop. Yeah, right. and then the system guides you. The, the, the yeah, the, the the flight director guides you out of the the wind chair. Okay. So you fly basically the flight director. Okay, so, and, and they do, which is perfect. Um, then they climb up, they had a little bit over speed during the climb up, but it was just the miners, and they get away from the field, and now they remain in the air for about two hours before, uh, before the next uh, landing attempt. Um, right, so the second approach, when you read the report, it's in, in my opinion, it's very well planned. They have briefed normal go around, they briefed the windshield escape maneuver, they briefed where to go in case of a go around. They're very, very prepared. They set up for the approach and uh, they have a very low weight 54 ton uh, on this aircraft. Uh, what is the max weight? 66 something. 63. 66.3. Uh, yeah, 66.3. So it's about 12 tons below yeah. the, max, the max weight. And they set up the, the, the ref speed about 150 knots. Uh, and again, about 20, one, uh, 2,100 feet, the commander disconnects the autopilot or the throttle, flies on the hood, they're still in clouds. They continue down, and then at about 1,100 feet, there is a sudden increase in speed. So they have about 23 knots, going up to 176 knots speed. But no other warnings. Yeah, that's definitely a wind shear. 
Okay. Yeah. But, but should it be a warning yeah. if there's a wind shear? Yeah, but I mean, uh, maybe that was. Uh, it's hard to say why why it, it didn't uh, trigger the wind shear warning, but but. Uh, but uh, I ha ha have had that too with, with the 20 knots mm -hmm. uh, speed increase without, uh, without the trigger of the, the wind shear warning. So, so but uh, is this a mandatory go around? Yeah, I would, I would do a go around there because at 1000 feet you should be stabilized, uh, yeah, stabilized right. approach, and, and with that 23 knots uh, excessive speed you're not stabilized. So, so there is no reason for continuing that approach, I would, I would say. Okay. But, but I would say it, it, it's fine maybe to do an ordinary go around there since you don't have the wind shear warning. But. Is there any possibility you can continue and stay within the procedures? No, I wouldn't say that at, at 1100 feet since, since you, sh you okay. must be stabilized at 1000 feet. Okay, okay so, 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 so that's, a, that's a definite go around. And what kind of go around would you do then? With in mind, they had the wind shear warning in the previous approach, maybe a, it wouldn't be wrong to do a, a wind shear escape maneuver, of course. But, okay. but, but, but with, with only the being outside the envelope for stabilized approach, I would say it, it's not, not fault to do a, a normal go around there. Okay, you can do a normal go around. Yeah, I would say shear. so. But However, I what happens is the captain only says a bit vague, okay, go around. Yeah. And the first officer then replies with go round, but nothing else. No, that's a little bit vague. You should uh, be more, more, more assertive. Yeah, definitely. More telling the other pilot, yeah. uh, are we doing a normal go round, which is go round, flat 15, post rate gear up, L9 flat 5, or something yeah. like that. Or wind shear escape maneuver, final yes, thrust lever, lever confirmation. But he only says, okay, go round. And then I guess that the co pilot becomes a bit puzzled. Like, hmm. So he asks, flap 15? Yeah, because he don't get that call out from the captain. Exactly. So, so, so he, maybe he's not sure if he's doing a windshield escape maneuver or an ordinary go around. So he, he, because he don't get that no. flap 15 call from the captain, so he has to ask. Yeah, sure. Flap 15? And the captain replies immediately, flap 15. Yeah, that's to confirm it's going to be a normal go around procedure then. And he fired the trust lever. Now, Peter, explain for us, with a 55 ton, 12 ton below max landing weight, what happens when you fire all the thrust levers? Yeah, the aircraft's going to pitch up because the engines are low mounted. So, so that will give you a quite, uh, quite uh, noticeable pitch up. But isn't the pilot trained for that? Yeah, you, you know the Boeing behaves like that on low weight and maximum thrust. You have to sort of be prepared for that. Okay. It's going to be a lot of forces on, on the control column. So what happens now is like, uh, if I will trust levers and initiate the pitch, it goes a bit slowly, a little bit up, a little bit down, goes up again, goes down again, and then yeah. it reach the max of 18 and a half degrees pitch up, which is not that much pitch. Uh, no, it's below 20, which, uh, which is maximum, but, but uh, apparently he's, he's, um, can't find the, the attitude there. The pitch, so it's. Uh, I don't know why, but but. Uh, yeah, the, he, he, he struggles a bit, and yeah, he, definitely. And he also, for the last minute, he gives no proper calls. He's just uttering like ah, oh, uh, but but no calls, no calls at all. Yeah, he's kind of. Perhaps he's uh, blocked in a way. Yeah, he's blocked. He lost yeah. the situation awareness. Yeah, some, something something happens there. The co-pilot. According to the investigation, you can see that clearly on the cockpit voice recorder, he most likely had the situation under control. So he tried to prompt the captain, like, keep the pitch, keep 15, yeah. do this, do that. Yeah, that's true. But he never takes over. Is there any situation where the co-pilot, the lower in rank, must take over? Yeah, or when, when the captain becomes incapacitated. Could be mentally or physically, but but, or when you see that this this is dangerous, and and the, my colleague isn't responding to my on my my callouts, and that's the way. Then the, the the captain is incapacitated. So so the callout should be there. You're incapacitated. My controls. But this don't happens. No, in this case, it would have saved the flight, of course, if. 
he would, would have done that, definitely. We can actually take a look at quite a few uh, crashes where the co-pilot uh, has been in control but never taken over from the captain. Yeah, but yes. what, what is your opinion on that? I mean, you, you're a senior captain and let's say that you fly with a 22-year-old first officer. He, he just graduated from school, has 500 hours and suddenly he says, take your hands off my controls. What do you think then? Yeah, I would, uh, because we, we, we have that uh, way of working in, here in Scandinavia, I would say it's, uh, it's a teamwork. So, so if he says so, I, I must have been doing something wrong. So, okay. so, so there's no prestige in that. We leave the prestige behind them and work uh, as a team. So, so. Of course, in this case, we don't know. Uh, I, I, no, I'm not familiar with Flying Dubai either. Um, but he never takes over. And then the captain makes one more fatal thing. One of the very last thing he does is he takes the trim uh, on, on the control wheel. There's yeah, this the elevator switch. trim. Yeah. And he push that button forward keep it forward for 12 seconds, yeah. what will happen then? Yeah, well, he, he will trim the whole stabilizer. The show whole, you. Yeah. We're, I'm going to bring out my little... We'll fly out, fly the aircraft here. So, <laughs> if, if we have this one, so let's say that when you do the go around, it's going to be like, can you say that it's very heavy in the... So yeah, the, the thrust, since the engines are mounted below, yeah. below the wings, it's low winged, of course. Yeah, like like yeah. this, right? <laughs> yeah, with the engines. Yeah, low so so the, 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 the big thrust force here will, 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 will Go like pitch this, up. Yeah. Pitch, pitch up the aircraft. Yeah, of course. And you have to meet that with some f forward control column force yeah. to, to stop the pitch up, of course. And in this case, when I read a report, it's a bit vague. It's like the captain... He, he never really finds... No, it's uh, sort of uh, just uh, over-controlling, I think. It's yeah. too, too much input. And then when either, he push... Either way. Exactly. And then when he push the, the trim button, he sort of flies the aircraft with the trim. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. You should fly well, the aircraft with the elevator and then trim, ah, okay, trim so, so you get the, the, the f control force that you want to okay, have. Okay, so first... Even if it's heavy in either direction, you just hold it. Yeah, hold it there until you are at the pitch you want, and yeah. then you trim it for the correct force. Yeah. In this case, it should have been about 15 degrees yeah. in the go round. Yeah. And but he, he comes behind the aircraft, and and then finally he then pushed 12 seconds forward. So what yeah. will happen with the aircraft now from this position? Yeah, it will trim the aircraft for nose down. So, sort so of. It's, yeah, the elevator. Is trimmed uh, uh, and yeah, you have this uh, nose down situation, which, which is real dangerous. How I think is most it? pilots would like to fly the approach with a little bit. You have to push the push the okay. a little bit forward. Yeah. So if you if you let go of the control column, the nose will go up. Okay. Most pilots like it that way. That's the trim we will look for during the approach. I would say with the you fly it with a slight forward pressure, but the trimming down for 12 seconds that, that you almost well, uh, I think he, he, he was sort of totally out of low loop there I would say so too yeah because but is it possible to override the forces or is it too heavy 12 seconds well it depends on the speed of course uh, because the more the, the higher speed. the speed the higher aerodynamic um, force on the elevator so it's at some certain point there's, there's no way uh, to, to raise the nose. Uh, right. We know that from, from the 737 MAX yeah. uh, crash history, that, that with the too high speed uh, and with nose, nose down trim, you cannot recover. But, but in this case, I think Boeing uh, said it would be recoverable. Yeah, they said at, at, at one, so, he's, so. he's going up and down like this. And at, at one stage, they have about 11 degrees pitch up. And what the investigators say, if they have kept that, sort of just firmly hold the control yeah, wheel. Yeah, kept it there. Kept it there. They should have been recovering. What altitude was that? I don't remember. Uh, I think it's about, about 1,000 feet. Yeah, that's, 1, that's, feet. yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, sure yeah, does. So, so. Uh, anyway, anyway. Uh, so, so, so. Um, That's right. 
So when the pilot flying, in this case the captain, gives a little bit vague call, like, okay, go around. What is your obligation as a first officer then? You have to challenge your colleague, to, to, to challenge him to, to state what, what he's yeah. about to do. So state, what, are we doing a normal go around? Are we doing a windshield yeah, state maneuver? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so that's so. what you have to do, speak up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the investigation report, uh, there is a remark from one of his this, uh, co-pilots, uh, simulator sessions, saying that uh, you have to be more assertive and challenge uh, your captains, what his intentions mm, yeah. are. Uh, if you go back to your uh, aviation career, what is your opinion about assertiveness on the co-pilots? I think it's good. It's okay. been good, yeah. We don't have those problems. In, you talk Scandinavia now? Yeah, generally from, from my experience. Okay. That's because we work as a team. It's Works. a teamwork. Yeah. yeah, and then there's no problem with the prestige and that stuff. So, so if uh, the one guy is not happy with what the other guy is doing, it doesn't matter if it's the, if it's the captain or the, the co-pilot, we, we speak up. Okay. Generally, I would say. Once again, we don't really know. In this case, the captain was from Cyprus, the first officer, he was from Spain, and they worked on a Dubai operator. It's a sort of yeah. three cultures in a yeah, mix. Yeah, of course. Um, that, that complicates things. It complicates, yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I would say culture and attitudes is very contributing factor in very many accidents. Yeah, of course. Um, perhaps even in this one. Right. Uh, so they, they sort of finally hit the ground then with about, I think at about 50 degrees nose down, um, speed about 340 knots and 60 degrees left bank, which is also a bit puzzling. Yeah. So it's the last thing the captain does is give almost full rudder. Yeah, I think that's part of the, uh, is being to totally mentally blocked. It's, it's just a, some sort of reaction to, to, to use the rudder. They're flying for six hours and they're following the SOP accordingly. They do one go around uh, with the uh, windshield escape maneuver, which is perfect. And then the last minute, the very last minute, the captain loses his situation awareness completely and ending up with trimming the nose forward for 12 seconds. So what do you think about this? Well, it uh, must be some, some form of mental, mental breakdown, I would say. So, but it happens fast, yeah. really fast. So, so It's a very fast development. Yeah. I mean, it takes just a minute. They do the go around. It's a bit going a little bit up and down like this. Yeah, there he starts to lose, uh, lose the ball, I would say. Can't, yeah. find the, can't find the correct pitch. And, that starts to deteriorate from, from that point. So, what would you say should have stopped this? Or rather say, how should you have done for not making this happen? Well, the first officer sh should have, after he tried to, to um, get the captain to fly the right pitch, but, but, but it, it didn't happen. So there he should have uh, Taking over the controls. All right, taking over the controls. Yeah. So, yeah. So absolutely. one solution, in the, in the same scenario, the the captain does a vague go around, then the the first officer finally takes over the controls. Yeah, that's yeah, one maybe solution. Maybe already there, it was something that happened in his head. With yeah. That vague go around. We we don't know that, but but eventually, maybe it started there. And we also talked about it earlier that uh, when the captain does the go around with a vague call the first officer should speak up and really challenge him with okay are we doing a normal go around or a windshield escape maneuver yeah of course but of course that's yeah yeah but but they they take since he asked uh, for flap 15 and get the positive response from the captain there so then they're inside the uh, normal go around from that point so yeah right but, but yeah it's it's vague and i think he 
he he were somewhere else from that point in his head. Something most happened. likely. Yeah, yeah, most likely. Lost some the focus and, and I don't know. It's so strange because in many accidents, before before the crash itself, there are in most cases several sort of mistakes or they, they done violations or something like that. But in this case, nothing. No. The flight well, is strange. impeccable until yeah. the last minute. Yeah, that's strange. So it's, it is a strange one. But to just summarize, I would say uh, assertiveness from the first officer, yes, challenge absolutely. the captain, yeah. take over from the first yeah, officer, absolutely. and in general, just stay focused on what you are doing. Sort of, are we doing a normal go around or a yes. windshield escape maneuver, whatever yes. we do. Of course, that, so that's, that's the way to solve it. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so for a very much. interesting it flight a safety discussion. It was a pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks for watching Why Airplanes Crash. Next week, I will do a review of the Emirates crash, the 777 crash in Dubai. So stay tuned and don't miss next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.